last thing we discussed was the Ran. And the emphasis here is on appreciating the Torah. It's not just enough to study the Torah, but the Gemara tells us in the Durham that the reason why we lost Eretz Yisrael is because we didn't make the bracha over Torah and recite the bracha on the Torah before we study the Torah. And the Ran makes a big deal about the appreciation that we have to have for Torah to realize how important and unique Torah is. So that's called Lahachshiv es Erka. Erech means its value. If a person doesn't value the Torah that he studies, then no matter how much he learns, he omits the bracha, in effect. Whether he makes the bracha or not, he's, in effect, omitting the bracha. And the last thing that we wanted to discuss in the context of this ran and the emphasis on making the bracha, thanking Hashem, and appreciating the Erech HaTorah, the unique nature of Torah, is an idea that's mentioned by the Baal Beis Yaakov. And we've heard of Hasidic movements such as Regine and Ishbitza. And these various Chatseros of Hasidim, they joined forces. There was marriage from here to there. And the Rebbe said the following. We have our Gos Oshri in Mesech of Metzia in Elu Metzias. And we're going to see what we can understand from the Hagot Sashri on the Rosh and what it might mean for us in terms of the din of Birch HaSator. Ruvain buys metal from a non-Jewish blacksmith. He understood that it was a certain kind of lead. It's called in Hebrew bedil. If, if anybody wants to look it up for, a, you know, I'm, I'm not a metal expert, but there's something called bedil, based Talad Yud Lam. You could Google it in Hebrew. And it's, it's especially effective for covering a roof. So that's what Ruvain bought from this non Jewish uh, carpenter. Now Ruvain changes his mind and he decides he's not going to flatten out his roof. He wants to sell the Bedil, or what he thinks is Bedil, to his friend Shimon, his buddy Shimon. Shimon pays the value of the Bedil. And guess what happens now? Shimon does a process which in the Gemara is called hatacha, when you heat up a metal and you reduce it to a liquid, which is what you do when you want to use bedil to cover your roof. And on the, in, during the process, he finds out that it's not bedil at all. It's only layered on the outside with the deal. But guess what? It's Kesset. It's silver. Now, when Ruvain sells Shimon what he thinks is Bedil, and as it turns out, it's not Bedil at all. It's Kesset which is a much more expensive metal than lead. It's a rare metal. And he wants his money back from Shimon. And the question came in front of one of the Rishonim from the city of Metz, which I believe is in France. You can double check me on that. And Ruvain is claiming that Shimon 
has to pay him to make Kesef. Because that's what he sold him. On, no, on Venontin. And the Posek, to the surprise of everyone, says that Shimon doesn't have to pay him any money at all. Whatever he paid, he paid. The sale is valid. And he explains it in the following way. So imagine if you sell me something that you believe is only worth a fraction of the price that's really worth. And now when you find out that you sold me a precious metal that's worth much more and you want to claim, pay me the difference. And the posting says, I don't have to pay you. Why? He says the following. When Ruvain bought this metal from a guy and the assumption was it was lead because that's what he ordered, then Ruvain had no clue that he was buying Kesef, a more expensive metal. And therefore, Ruvain never actually acquired Kesef. The hear this? When Ruvain pays money at the price of the deal of lead, he only owns that which corresponds to the value that he paid and not beyond. So his Kenyan, according to that goal, Sashri, is a Kenyan on Bedil because that's what he paid for. And that's the amount he paid. The amount of money he paid was commensurate to the value of Bedil. Therefore, he has no right to claim that Shimon should pay him for Kesef because he, Ruve, never owned the Kesef. And the Gosa Shri says there have been a time accepted this principle. Excuse me for one second. Tony, I'm, I'm in Canada now. Do you remember Wednesday? I don't know if I have my schedule. You just sent me a message. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Now, how do we understand this in terms of the Gemara Nidarim and the question of reciting the Bracha before Torah? So the Rebbe says the following A Kenyan of a person. An acquisition is defined by how much he values the object that he receives, that he made an acquisition on. We have a concept called Kinyana Shal Torah. We acquire possession over the Torah. We slave, we work, and through our Tirch and Ayyigiyah, we acquire the Torah. In fact, the Mishnah has 48 methods in which we're calling the Torah. He says that. The Kenyan in Torah is commensurate to the Hakaras Erka Shal Torah. To the extent that you value the Torah, that's the extent to which you have a Kenyan on Torah. So the Torah you study is invaluable. You can't put a price tag on it. It's worth Yakara Himi Pninim, more than precious stones. But do we appreciate it as such? Im ein hu makir erka shel Torah, ein bo ela kinyan lefi erka shu makir. And that's a that's terrible, if you know what I mean. I didn't want to say catastrophic, but imagine you value Torah at X. It's it's worth twice that amount, three times that amount a million times that amount, and you will get the Kenyan of Torah that corresponds to what you consider the Erka Shel Torah to be, not what it is in objective terms. Ruvain purchased Kesef, but he didn't know that he purchased Kesef. 
and therefore he only made a kinyan on the deal. And this is going to have a tremendous impact on the Gemara, the famous, famous principle of the Gemara in Sota Dafchaf Aleph, Torah, Magna, Umatsla, Torah, protects a person, saves a person. And the Gemara tells us in Chagiga, the Yushalmi in Chagiga, that Viter HaKadosh Baruch Aleph on Hoseyem, God was willing to protect the Jewish people and overlook their sins as long as they were studying Torah. That's the power of protection of the Torah. And yet, we lost Eretz Yisrael. Why didn't the Torah protect us from exile? And the answer is because we didn't make the bracha over Torah before we studied the Torah, meaning we didn't evaluate Torah as it is. So our Torah reaches this low level, which cannot protect us. Because when do we say that Torah Megno Matzla, that's only the Kenyan Torah that we have. And if we have a Kenyan of Torah minus the Bracha, because we don't appreciate what the Torah is, then our Kenyan Torah is very, very limited relative to what it could be in potential, and therefore the protection that we'll get from that Torah, which is a reflection of Kenyan Torah, is going to be low ebb, unfortunately, and therefore Ma of the Haaretz, the Gemara Nidarim, we lost Eretz Yisrael. Where was the Torah that we studied to protect us? Where was the Torah that we studied to defend us? And the answer is because we didn't make the bracha over the Torah before we studied the Torah. And perhaps this will shed a light on a famous statement of the Gemara in Sanhedrin Daf Kuf, Omar Ab Yochanan, Mipne Ma Menash Gechazi. You remember Elisha had the sidekick by the name of Gechazi. Mipne Shekara Larabo Bishmo. He called his Rebbe by his first name. Instead of calling him my Rebbe, my master, he called him Eli, you know, Eli, you know, Elisha, Eli. Shednemar, the Pasuk tells us in this, in Malachim Beis, Perakid, by Yomar Gechasi Adoni Amelech, Zosa Isha, Zebina, Asher Hichia Elisha. He didn't even have the the honor and the respect for his Rebbe to call him Rebbe Elisha. Elisha. We're on a first name basis. Now, wait a second. Let's read the Parsha. Let's read the Tanakh. The Tanakh says that he took money when Elisha cured Naaman. Naaman was the Saratzva of Aram, the arch enemy of the Jewish people. But Aram was desperate because Naaman, the Saratzva, the commander in chief, took sick with leprosy. And they had heard that Elisha, the Navi, so even our enemies believe sometimes in, in the Koch of our Chachamim, of our Navim. And Gehazi decided that when Naaman wanted to express his gratitude and send money, and Elisha refused to take a penny for the treatment that he had given. You remember the seven times he went into the yard and the whole bit. And Gehazi came forward and took the money as if to say, my master wants to be paid. And that's why he was punished because of Midas HaChamdanut. Chamdanut means the love of money. He lowered the Torah for the sake of his own pocketbook. And the Pasuk says, And the Pasuk is outspoken about why Gehazi was struck in with, with leprosy for all generations. So why does the Yushalmi say that Gehazi was punished because he called his Rebbe Elisha? 
by his first name. And the answer is that had Elisha had the respect for Torah, for his master of Torah, his Rebbe Elisha, had Gechazi, excuse me, whatever I said, had Gechazi had that respect, then the Torah would have protected him despite the fact that he deserved the punishment which he deserved for taking the money of Naman, and that was a Chil Hashem. Why didn't the Torah that he learned from his Rebbe Elisha protect him? And the answer is because he called his Rebbe by his first name. And a Talmud has to have covered for his Rebbe. And it means that he, Gechazi, did not have an evaluation and a, an appreciation, a, a Hakaras Erka Shal Torah. And if you don't have Hakaras Erka Shal Torah, the Torah is not going to protect you. So if you ask me why Gechazi was punished, it's because of the Chil Hashem when he took the money from Naaman. But if you ask me why the Torah of Gechazi couldn't protect him, as the Gemara says in Sota, that Torah is Magino Matzila, the answer is because he called Elisha by his first name. But getting back to the Gemara Nidorim, Alma of the Aretz, the Gemara says that first they went to the Chachamim and then they went to the Nevi'im and nobody knew the answer until they finally went to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, and Almighty God and responded, Al Shalo Birchu Batorat Chila. And those are the words of the Navi Yirmiya when he says, Al Azvam Es Torasi. But what about all the explanations that the Gemara gives us in Mesech the Yoma, on Daftes, and elsewhere? That we lost Eretz Yisrael because of three Averis Chamuros, and if we lost Eretz Yisrael because we omitted the bracha on Torah, why couldn't the Chachamim figure that out? Why couldn't the Nevi'im figure it out? The Nevi'im should have known that. And why is the punishment so severe? And one of the great Chachmei Achronim, the Torah Chaim, he says that the Navi, when he asked Alma of the Haaretz, he didn't mean to ask which was the Chet, single out one sin, which brought about the loss and the exile. It was very well known that they had violated the three cardinal sins of Odesara, Gila, Reis, He was asking a different question. How was it that the Jewish people came to the point, to the low level where they violated the most severe cardinal sins? What was the root cause of violating these sins, which eventually brought about the loss of the land and the Churban of the bias. And this question was especially profound because the people of Israel in those days were studying Torah. And Torah has the power, right? Barasi Yitzhahara, Barasi Torah Tavlin. And Torah saves us and protects us from sin. How could they have come? How do you reconcile the fact that they were learning Torah and yet they came to this low state of violating the most severe fundamental violations of the cardinal sins. Where's the Torah Tavlin that would save us and protect us from faith? Why didn't the Torah protect them from Kisholon, for Chet? Why didn't the Torah save them like a shield against the eight Sahara. They had no answer. Only the Rebona Shalom knew the answer. And that is 
that although they studied Torah, but Hashem understood, because Hashem is your day of clothes for life, that their study of Torah was not Lishma. And a Torah study that's not Lishma does not have that school of power to protect a person and to save him from sin. Okay. Now, there's an essay here which I wanted to study with you on page 455. It's called Limud Torah Vasias HaTorah. And a lot of the focus of this essay. is about a principle that connects the study of Torah as an intellectual pursuit with the implementation of Torah. The Gemara tells us in Kedushin, Gadol Talmud HaMevil De Mais. And the Gemara Maid Katan, tells us that if he's lomed shalom and aslilmod, lon aslasos, is nefcha shulchas yopanov, it's not worth that Torah. So let's begin this discussion with a famous question about the Torah. We don't know exactly when the Torah was given. The Tanoim literally racked their brains to try to figure out what was the date based on when they came to the Midbar, Midbar Sinai, and based on the fact that they knew the Torah was given on Shabbos, different calculations. But the Torah itself doesn't really reveal exactly when the Torah was given. In the case of Pesach, or Rishon Bar Sayom, in the case of Sukkot, Bechamisha Sayom L'Chodesh Hashvi, when it comes to the great, most important episode in history, in Jewish history, the Torah doesn't tell us the date. In fact, if not for Sphira Saomer, we really wouldn't know which day is Chagashvuos. Because Chagashvuos is only a matter of counting the Omer. And the 50th day is sanctified as Chag Shvuos and commemorated as Yom Mat and Torah Sein. And the Ran says in Masech the Psochim, explaining Svir Omer, that Sholu Yisrael, the Medjur says, the Moshe Masai Navaras al Kimar al when will the Torah be given according to the measures? That's the question that Klal Yisrael asked Moshe Rabbeinu. So imagine, Klal Yisrael leave Mitzrayim. They're curious to know when the Torah is going to be given. They understood that the purpose of Yitzhak Mitzrayim was to culminate in Matan Torah at Sinai. When is it going to be given? And Moshe Rabbeinu says, count 50 days. What happens when the Torah is given? This is the final stage of Yitzhak Mitzrayim. Even though 50 days earlier they were liberated from Mitzrayim, but nevertheless, as Avodim Mishukhrarim, there was still a little bit of a, of a vestige of Avdus in the personalities of the Jewish people. When would the Jewish people finally achieve their essence? It's going to be at Maibar Harsin. And the proof is in the Pasuk. At the end of Chumash, in Varim Perch of Zion, Hayom Hazeh Niyeso La'am. Li'am means the Amskula, the unique Am HaMiyuchad that makes us different from all other nations. Asher Boch HaBon Mikol Amim. It's Nesina Satora. Torah. 
in all the cases of the other nations, whatever elements of Torah they have, let's say Sheva Mitzvah B'nai Noach, they emerge as nations before they get the Torah. We are only called a nation, Hayom Hazen Yisrael It's only after we receive the Torah, we become a unique people. We become a nation. Am Yisrael Torasam Kodmolehem. The Torah came before we emerged as a nation. The Torah is really the introduction, the prologue, if you will, to our people becoming a nation. And if that be the case, then we have to appreciate that Torah is not just a body of knowledge, of wisdom, and a discipline like any other discipline, but it's going to carve out a people, a nation that's going to be created out of the Torah. Torah has to be created first, and then the nation. Beseder Havaya, Havaya means the emergence of the people of Israel, Kadma Torah Liam Yisrael. Torah comes first. If only the Jewish people today would understand that. HaTorah Eina Rak Chachma Nilmedes Elihim Areches HaTfusim Shalpiyam Osui Klal Yisrael. The Torah is like what, what's it called? A um, cookie cutter. What's it called when you pour the dough into a uh, mold? Is that a word? Like a mold? Could be a form. Form, a mold. Do you know what I mean? A mold? You know, you pour something into a mold and it takes the shape of the mold. I mean, ask your, ask your wives. I mean, they'll tell you, you know, you pour the dough into, you want to make a, a square cookie or so, you pour it into a mold. Klal Yisrael are like a liquid that has no shape, no form. We pour Klal Yisrael into a mold. The mold makes us as a Tzuras nation. And that mold is the Torah. The Torah came before Klal Yisrael. We were forged and formed by the mold. And that mold is the Torah. Avaya Sa'am was Torah first, and then the Am emerges. Hayom, after the Torah, Niyesem La'am. That makes us radically different than any other nation on the face of the earth. Every nation exists as a nation. They occupy a land, they have a nationality, they have their own flag. And then you know, you can give them a measure of Torah, Zion mitzvahs. But that comes after they've already emerged as a nation. We have to appreciate that as a nation, we only emerge after the Torah. The Torah creates us and forms, as we said, the mold. And therefore, we could shed a new light on the famous Medrash in Bracious Rabbah at the very beginning of the Torah. And this you'll have on page 456 if you want to follow it inside. Torah Meris Haniya Yisi Kliu Nasa Shalakadish Baruch. Benoik Shema Ola Melech Bosa Vedon Bonep Altin. Eno Bona Vidas Atzma Lomidas Uman. It's got to have a plan. Without the design, he can't build anything. He can't create anything. And this is all a marshal. What was the plan for the creation? Of the entire universe, Mabit Bitora Uboreas Do you remember that? It's such a famous 
measures is tackle the rice of our alma. What is the relationship between Am Yisrael and the Torah? The Torah is going to define the people of Israel. Do we always understand the deeper meanings of the ways of the Torah, the mitzvahs of the Torah? Tamei Amitzvah, as you know, is a very, very tricky, speculative endeavor. A person, if he belongs to the other nations and he wants to study their legal system, he has a right to demand in the, in the context of studying political history and legal history of any nation, what are the reasons? How do these laws develop? What were the cultural or mores? What were the moral considerations? What underlies the law? And if the lawmakers in the legislature cannot justify why they created certain laws, then the people have a, have a right to rise up against these laws. Because all of the other nations exist independent of the law. And the law is meant to be a logical creation of the human mind. And therefore, we have hakiros and we have drishos and investigations. I myself, when I was in graduate school, I took courses in the history of law. I still remember a great book by a guy named Hart, H-A-R-T, about the structure of law. And we have to understand law. That's in the secular world. That's a world of chachma, a world of human knowledge. However, chachira kazu eno nitenes leyoseis b'mitzis ha-Torah. With regard to the laws, the legislature of the Torah, we cannot engage in those chachiros. Because anything that we suggest as a possible explanation Call Hezber Anitan limitos. It's all based on the way we understand human nature and the reality that we live in in a particular time and a particular space in a particular social context. But the Torah is not given in a particular context, in a particular time and place. The life that is current and contemporary, because the Torah came before everything. You want to study secular law, you start with the, the society and then you create the plans. Which plans do you want to create for a legal system? that would be appropriate for that place and that time. But in the case of Torah, those plans came first. And the Gemara Psachim on Nundal, it tells us, Shiva Dvarim Nivru Konim Briyas HaOlam. There were seven creations that predated the creation of the world, and Echemem, one of the seven, is Torah. Therefore, any explanation that we give for a mitzvah is all based on our limited, finite human knowledge, our understanding of the society that we live in and the needs of society. And of course, the, the obvious example of this that comes to mind is the moral in the of the Rambam. He dedicates one third of the entire work to Tamei Mitzvahs. And you read them today. What are we up to? 2022? And they're meaningless. You know, you eat swine and it's going to cause this and that. And you need the Shabbos because of this and that. Strange. We read the Rambam. The great Rambam. The greatest thinker probably since Rabbeinu HaKadosh who authored the Mishneh Torah Shemitivon Uchayim 
who authored the Pirish HaMishnah Islam Rama. And we get to the Mordechai Vukim. Okay, we're fine with the first section, fine with the second section. Some say that the Ramam really wanted to write a commentary on Tanakh, and it's incorporated in the ter- first, first two sections of Mordechai Vukim. And we get to the third section. And it's so foreign to us. It's so strange to our ears. And the Ramam, in his context, historically had to explain the Torah to those, even members of his own family, who needed some rational explanation for the Torah law. But you and I know that Lomi Boy Chukim, we don't know why the Torah says you can't cook milk and meat together and eat milk and meat together and you can't combine Pishtan and Semer, which is Shatnez. And such a Chok like Paraduma cannot defy even the great mind of Shlomo Amel, the Chachami and we can give so many examples. But even those mitzvahs that we give rational explanations for, those are not the explanations. And that's how the Ramban interprets the Mishnah in Besech of Brachas, Ha'omer al-Kan Tzipor al-Kan Yirach is Vishaskin also. I mean, isn't it true that we send away the mother bird so that we don't cause the mother bird suffering when we take away the siblings, the fledglings. And the Mishnah says, no, don't offer any explanations when you do so, you're in a dangerous, treacherous territory. And therefore, any Tamea mitzvahs that you'll find in Chazal, in Rishonim, in Achronim, Lo Nemru El Karivis Ha Mitzvahs El Sechleinu. You know, to make it a little bit easier for us to understand the Torah. But never for us to, to believe that we solve the mystery, that we understand why the mitzvah was given. We could explain what we take away from the mitzvah, how the mitzvah might have an impact on us. And for that, we study Pnevius HaTorah, the secrets of the Torah. But to say that we understand why the divine infinite being mandated this mitzvah, legislated this mitzvah, that we can never claim because our understanding is limited. That's why the Gemara says at the end of Machis that what is it, Chavakuk, I believe, you'll check me out, came and he reduced the entire Torah to one mitzvah, to the Amunah, to the mitzvah of Ba'adam Amunah Yechia, where our, our, ultimately our fulfillment of the mitzvahs, all 613 is a matter of Amunah, a matter of faith. And here he quotes from Aaron Pup. I don't know if any of you knew Rabbi Aaron Cutler. I was, I think, 11 years old when he died. I didn't know him. I knew Rabbi Schneer, who was very friendly to me, very warm to me. But Rabbi Aaron, I didn't know. My father knew Rabbi Aaron. And the truth is, and again, it's my limitation, but when I study and I've tried many times the Torah of Rabarin, I get totally lost. But here we have a statement of Rabarin that maybe fits into a unique category. People don't realize that Rabarin was a great al almost scary, almost frightening. Misha Bola Farishala Harach is Divrei Torah Pisichlo. A person who comes to the table and studies Torah and he thinks he can understand the Torah based on his logic and explain its deeper meanings and the underpinnings of the mitzvos, a reza bechinas moil bekodshin. It's me'ila. He's like taking something that's kodesh, that's so lofty, that defies our intellectual human capabilities of understanding and he's making it into a lower a lower, he's desecrating that level of Kedusha. 
Shumotzi es a Torah mi marom kedusha. Torah is on the highest level of kedusha, and he takes it down. He brings it into the mundane, secular domain of finite materialism. Shall have an also of his limited physical understanding. Ami yusedes al tfisas achayim ha'aroyim which are built on our comprehension of temporary life, temporary meaning as opposed to infinite life. And therefore, the Ramam says the following, a person Right, this is at the end of Hilchas Be'ilah. You know that the Ramam always at the end of the halachas, not always, but most of the time, he'll give us a little bit of a of an inspiration, of an idea that's meant to be agadic and ashkafic. At the end of Hilchas Be'ilah, he says the following. A person should try to understand the Torah, the Holy Torah, as much as he can. But what happened, asks the Rambam, when he gets to the point where he cannot find the cause of the mitzvah, he cannot find the time of the mitzvah, lo yimta, lo ta. Says the Ramam, here's where you have to learn from Meila. Al yehi kal bi'ena. Don't take the Torah light, lightheartedly. Velo yaros, lalos, el Hashem, like after, remember the whole story there of Amolek and 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 Torah and, and and Moshe warns the people not to try to climb up. It's out of your league. The lote machshavta bo. If he thinks about the Torah, ki machshavto b'shar divrei chol. He uses his same logic that he borrows from Chol, from the world and the domain of the secular, the mundane, the limited, the finite, and he wants to apply those same categories and those same machshavos to the world of the Holy Torah, to the Torah that is on the level of Kachim, then he is in violation of Me'ilo. He is taking something holy and desecrating it. And the Ramam offers a Kalvachom. Umayim chevtsei ha-kodesh eitzim avonim. Kevet shenikra shem adon olam aleim bitvarim bilvad. Niskadshu kol anoig ben minik chol mo'al kalvachom ala mitzvah. Shechokak lonu. Hakadosh baruch hu. Shelo yachshov bohem machshavto ki divrei chol. Imagine, the Ramam says, you have Eitzim Havon. You've got something that is totally of, devoid of any sanctity. And all you do is you say the words Lashem. It should be for the Mizbeach, it should be Lashem. Then just with that verbal declaration, you have sanctified Eitzim Havon. And that means that you'll be subject to me'ila if you abscond and take from that object. It's kulo hegdik. We're talking about Kedusha's Talmud now. It's kulo hegdik with an isa me'ila. If you use the object, etzim bavonin, for your own purposes, you have now have desecrated kodesh, kodesh, because of the very one declaration that you said this I'm being magdish for Kedusha's Domin. And therefore, call a noeg by minachol mal, call the chomer le mitzvah, shechokak lono akodesh baruch. We're not talking about Eitzim Avonin. We're talking about a mitzvah which is kulo kodesh. Shelo yachshu behem achshaves divrei achol. And you start thinking about the mitzvahs the same way you would talk and think about divrei achol. How much more so? That qualify as me'ila behegdish. 
And in the past, you may recall that we discussed the famous statement of the Chazdei David. When I say famous, we made it famous. But anyway, the famous statement of the Chazdei David, Rabbi David Pardo, regarding Birchas HaMitzvahs. Every mitzvah is Kodesh Kadoshim. And the Torah requires us to be Poder Kodesh Kadoshim before we benefit from it. And that's the bracha. And if we don't recite the bracha over a mitzvah, then we are in, in effect stealing that mitzvah, embezzling the mitzvah. We are in violation of the Isra Me'ilu. And now we're on page 457. Aristotle was a great chacham. He was brilliant, but he came to the conclusion that we could only prove the existence of that which we can sense with one of the five senses. Anything that was beyond the scientific explanation based on our, our understanding of re physical reality through sight, through hearing, etc., is false. It cannot be MS unless, according to Aristotle, we can understand it without logic. So Aristotle represents the power and the supremacy of logic. There's nothing further than our approach and appreciation of Torah. Because again, as we said before, Torah came before the world, before the creation of the physical world. Our Sefer Torah does not have vowels in it. There's no Nikud in the Sefer Torah. I'm not sure we have to study the status of a Sefer Torah after he added vowels. Not only that, there are no Tamim in the Sefer Torah. Meaning Tame Amikra, Tra. Why not? I mean, wouldn't it make sense yeah, I remember when they came out first with those Gemaras. You remember this with the vowels in it? And, you know, they separate into paragraphs. And, you know, so there's those who said, no, 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 we got to work hard to understand the Torah. Don't just uh, tell me where to put the comma. And Baruch Hashem, today, we're experienced Talmud HaKham. None, none of us need vowels. But you may remember the days when we were children, and we said, why did they give us vowels? Tell me where the be sentence begins, where it ends. Imagine the Sefer Torah that vowels. And the one who addresses this question is none other than Rabbeinu Bechai in his commentary on, on Bamidbar Yudalif. And Rabbeinu Bechai says the following. There's no question that nikud and vowels are crucial to understand the Torah. Lamila Minukedes. Once you put vowels into the word, what have you done? An amazing finisher of Rabbeinu B'chai. You've limited the Torah. Now I can only interpret the Torah based on its vowels. But Mila She'ena Mukedes, it has no vowels. Yechol is parish b'kama ofanim b'kama ponim. And here we have shivim ponim letor. He says, look at the word tof nun ches, tof ches nun mem. Mm. 
It can be understood in so many different ways, but only because there are no vowels in the Torah. Lotichana might mean milosh and chen. It might be milosh and chania. It might be milosh and chinam. This is like a wild game that we're going to play. We're going to offer three different interpretations for a word that has four letters. And he says those three inter interpretations are oblivious to the Pshutal Shal Mikra, which is Lashon Chanina. So we got Chanina, and we've got Chen, and we got Chanoya, and we got Chino. Four different meanings of one word of four letters. And now he goes through a list of Droshos of Chazal all over Shas to prove, you that, prove to you that Chazal accepted all four interpretations. For example, a Gemara in Avodah Zorah and Avchof, Lo Sichonem, Lo Titelem Chen. You're not allowed to say how beautiful this guy is. I mean, how many of our people never are even aware of such a thing? Talk about Miss Universe and Hercules and I don't know what. What else do we have? We have a Cree of Lo Tichonem. With a chirit. And that means, you're not allowed to let the goyim live in the land and give them ownership of the land of Israel. What else do we have? We don't give gifts to the goyim. I mean, the you know, post have allowed it because, you know, you owe him a favor, he did this for you, and so forth and so on. Says Rabbi Nebuchadnezzar that Hatnua Hanikud Tisnonea Mamashwasad Ate Kia Osios Hem Guf Fanikud Hu Hanefesh. The letters of the Torah. You want, to, you want to say hello to our friends from Canada? Hi, everybody. How are you? It's Joe. It's Yuri. Yeah, we have a couple of Israelis here with us today. Bruce Bruce. and it's uh, David, David Spiegel. Spiegel, Bobby Silverstein. Silverstein. I mean, these are my camera. Is Bobby really They there? still remember me. Okay, great. Because you're unforgettable. Oh, right, right, right. Flattery will get you everywhere. L'chaim. Can you make L'chaim on Vasa? So I want to try to understand this last line in Rabbeinu Bachai, and then we'll, we'll probably be able to fit in maybe the Red Baz and wrap it up. Hatnu'a hanikud tisnonea mashmos hatebu. When you move around the vowels, you move around and change the meaning of the word. But this is where I get confused. I need your help. Kia osios heina guf as if to say you can put a different nefesh into each goof. You know, it's take a goof, it's made up of four letters, or whatever vowels. And every time you change the vocalization, you change the nefesh, which means the essence and the meaning of the word. Joe, I see uh, you're shaking your head. The way I could you not say, Rav, that what it's saying is the 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 goof is is limited to this to a certain thing. The nefesh is is infinite uh, to a certain extent. Not that it's a different nefesh, but the nefesh can expand out. It can go everywhere, right? So I think what he's saying is that since the goof cannot be expanded. How do you, like, let's say, for example, you wake up one morning and, you know, you're in such a mood and you decide this and that, you make decisions. Like, I woke up one day and I decided we're moving to Efra. And my wife thinks I'm crazy. I'm nuts. Oh, somebody agreed with me there, I think. 
Why is it that every day a person is mischadish, like HaKadosh Baruch is mischadish for Tuvah V'Koyam Tamid? That's because the nefesh is fluctuates, so to speak. It changes, and, and hopefully in a good way. And those are the nekudos. The osios are the group. They'll not change. But the difference between you know, one day of nefesh and another day of nefesh, it could be in the same goof. That same Tom, Dick, or Harry changes from one day to the next. Radically. And those are the nekudos. All right, let's just see if we can quickly fin finish in the Radbaz. I have here behind me the Radbaz. It took me years to collect it. But my children don't seem to appreciate it. <laughs> anyway, they were all published in Venice. So the Radbaz, who wrote tons of chuvas, he was a prolific writer. He lived five centuries ago in Egypt. He has a new interpretation on the Gemara and Shabbos. The Gemara tells us in Shabbos, Teiches, we've seen it a million times. Sha'ala Moshe Rabbeinu Lekabal said, Torah, the Malachim said, what is this human being, flesh and blood, doing up here, you know, with the Malachim? And Amrulo, when HaKadosh Baruch Hu explains to them, Allah, that God is, that Moshe is here in order to receive the Torah, they say, Tnalanu, leave the Torah up here in the heavens. As the Pesach says in Tilim Asher, Tnalanu, Tnalanu, your beautiful, glorious Torah that's infinite belongs up here with the angels in Shamayim. And of course, Hashem turns to Moshe Rabbeinu and he says, give him an answer. And at the end, they, they confessed. The Amrin declared, Hashem Adonenu Ma'adir Shimcha B'chala Aret. So the Rad Baza asks, did the Malachim not realize the obvious answer of Moshe Rabbeinu? A child would understand. There's no Ritzicha, there's no Neuf, there's no Gneva, there's no Yetahara up in Chamayim amongst the Malachim. Why were they asking for the Torah? Says the Rad Baz, they didn't read the Torah the way we read it. We read it with words. Each word is separate from another word. They read it in a very spiritual way. And that's called Shei Motzav Shal HaKadosh Baruch Hu, the Ramban's introduction to Chumash. And therefore, in their reading of the Torah, the Torah was totally abstract, totally spiritual, totally divorced from this world. And therefore, the Torah belongs to them in their spiritual, you know, it's, they're not bodies, they're spirits. And they ask for the Torah. Says at Baz, what was the answer of HaKadosh Baruch Hu? Why did he reject and exclude the arguments of the Malachim? Yesh le Torah gam kriya acheres. There's another way of reading the Torah. Not the way you read it where the letters just flow one letter into the other with a spiritual message that's only appropriate on high for the Malachim Asharis. But there's a physical osios and tevos with pisuk, and we read each word separately that's a kriya gashmis not a kriya ruchmis kiderech ube'ene b'nei adam and whether it is in Toma Vitara, whether it is in Isa Veheta whether it is in Torah Bechiv this is the way the Torah has to be read Hashem wants it to be read in Tevos in Pisukim in Tamim, in the Kudos, so that it be appropriate for this world. 
And why don't we write Tamim and Nikud in the Sefer Torah? She came Bikesh HaKadosh Baruch Hu Shia B'Torah Shteikriyos. The Torah now gets two Kriyos. It's like a Kriya Niksiv. There's going to be a Kriya Ruchnis and a Kriya Gashmis. And every individual is going to have to understand the Torah according to his level, whether it be Begashmis or Beruchnis. Says Rad Baz, our printed Chumoshim that have Nikud with Amim, Eitz Laso Seferu Torasecha. We shouldn't forget the Kriya Gashmis. But that's not the way the Torah was given. The Nikud and the Tamim on the one hand limit the Torah the same way that you physically limit that which is material, but it's not to undermine the infinite nature of the Torah. The Torah Bekriya Ruchnas. And that's why the Sefer Torah is allergic to Tamim and the Kudos. Because every single word, every single letter of the Torah has tile tilim chal drashos. It's infinite. And to add the kudos and piskeitamim would mean to limit the Torah, constrict it, and withdraw it into a, into a finite entity. And we always have to remember that although the Torah has finite words with the kudos and tamim, because the Torah is given to aretz, but nevertheless, at the same time, the Torah is ruchnitz, and there are no nekudos, and there are no tam. So this is where we're going to stop for today. Let's just make a note of we got up to page 458. And how many more pages do we have? All right. We got about four or five pages left. I don't know.